Bonjour, Vox est de Luxembourg. J'espère que vous passez des moments agréables à Vox de Luxembourg. Um, and uh, je vais switcher en anglais parce que c'est trop normalement mentionné en anglais. And uh, here we go. So the talk today is going to share in a little bit of experience of and um, some hypotheses as well about patterns, best practices, ideas on how we can build applications and software uh, enable us to increase velocity while at the same time building a secure software. So we all know that the demand for speed, especially with innovation, is increasing. Users nowadays no longer want to wait for months, weeks, or even days to get their new features shipped, to get their bugs fixed, to get their user experience improved. The more, you, the more fast you are in shipping features, the more you increase the engagement, the more you ha you, the market share is bigger, and that means good numbers for your business. However, focusing on speed alone is not enough. And we all know a company that was bragging for speed and even has one of its mottos as moving fast. However, it quickly reached a roadblock since it somehow forgot about security. So investing in speed only uh, proved its limitation and it kind of break the relationship, the trust relationship and the loyalty relationship between you and your customers, clients, users. So we need kind of show a little bit of care and a little bit of trust on how we handle user data and how to build secure applications that are also reliable and resilient. And that's what the promise of DevSecOps is about. Uh, so we all want to ship software faster, fix boxes faster, uh, improve the user experience faster. However, security is also required. Um, and that's the, DevOps mo the DevSecOps movement trying to bring them together, try to ensure that uh, we have a place, a seat in the table to everyone, both the Dev people, the security people, and the Ops people. So DevSecOps, or the promise, and uh, quick note here, I hate the name, but for, the, uh, for this presentation, we have to stick with it, so sorry for that. So DevSecOps try to save a seat in the table for everyone. Enable new developers to do what they do best, sh shipping code faster, fixing bugs, improving the user experience. Enable also the operations to ship the release as fast as possible to its users. And it also ensure a seat on the table to security people, making sure that our releases is as secure as they should be. So you probably got, idea, got an idea of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. I'm going to talk about the Formula One. Uh, and the talk is based about this, uh, I got the idea from the talk based on this Netflix series. How many of you watch it, Drive to Survive? Cool, what a crowd, cool. So you will get a lot of references throughout this presentation. But just to say that the Formula One and the motorsport in general is a, uh, not a safe sport to say the least. It's really dangerous. It says so in the badges and the ticket you get when you go to a Formula One races, everyone in the, in the pit uh, have a badge that say that the Formula One is, uh, is a dangerous sport. However, the FIA, which is the entity that manages uh, the Formula One and all the logistics, onboarded into a multi-generation, multi-layered uh, promise and objective to make the Formula One uh, more secure. That has been said while watching this documentary or Siri during the pandemic, because, you know, we had a lot of time. We didn't have so much things to do. Then I started watching the Netflix documentary. And for the people that didn't watch it, it basically tells the behind the scenes of the Formula One in a dramatic slash entertaining way, you know, and Netflix way, whatever, like the excels in making drama. But in one of the episodes and the 2020 Formula One uh, season, this happened. The driver is Roman from the Haas team who was driving 
with 160 miles per second. That's more than 300 kilometers per hour. And the car reached or uh, hit a barrier, and it turned instantly into a fireball. Now, by any measure, it's a death sentence. Even for the Formula One people, they were scared if uh, Roma will make it alive or not, unless a miracle happened. And guess what? It did happen. Roma not only managed to get out of the car sane and safe, but he managed to get out of the car by himself. And that got me thinking, the Formula One people, the car manufacturers, should be doing something right, should be doing a lot of things right, actually, to ensure the safety of the driver. And that got me thinking what we should achieve if we design our architecture, our IT systems, with the same level of devotion. So the thing I noticed throughout the series uh, and throughout the episode is that they don't mention security much. They talk a lot about safety. And I am not a native English speaker, so I use them interchangeably. And for me, they mean more or less the same thing. Then I opened the dictionary and I found that security means the state of being free from danger or threat. And if you think about it, this is not actually what we are trying to achieve from security. We know that from the moment we put our system facing the internet, the system is no longer free. There are dozens of hundreds of things that can go wrong. There are dozens of malicious users, attackers, hackers, that are trying to sneak into your system and break your system, steal the data, sell it into a dark market. So there are a lot of things that make our system not free from danger of threat. However, safety means the condition of being protected from danger, risk, or injury. And this is what we are trying to achieve. We're trying to make our system as safe as possible, and we're trying also, even if something happens, an attacker manages to get access, we had a bad day, our system are down. We're trying to minimize the damage. And be assured, I'm not going to start a dev safe ops movement, the name is bad enough, but if we design a good architecture in a good way, so good architectures should let us the IT people, developers, security people, the ops, go as fast as possible, ship as fast as we can in a safe manner. And I did some research afterward and uh, how the Formula One people, how the FIA managed to ensure the safety of the drivers even if the worst thing happened, a terrible crash incident as we saw earlier with Roma. And they found that they have a lot of measures that they introduced it throughout the year. And in this presentation, this slide is a lot of text in there, but yeah, bear with me. They ha we will talk about 10 safety measures. Five of them are pre-crash measures. The thing that they ensure before the race, before the crash, to make sure that the driver is safe when the crash happened. And, say, and five post-crash measures, if the crash happened, what they do to ensure and get the driver as fast as they can out from the crash incident. And those measures did work, actually. Don't trust me. See the numbers. This graph mentions the timeline of uh, the safety measures when they were introduced and the number of deaths. And as you can see, as we introduced more and more safety measures, the number of death or deadly accidents decreased. And also the number of days between fatal accidents. You see that's increased, it started to increase on the right left of your or the, yeah, on the right left of your screen. You can see that the days between fatal accidents has increased as we add more and more safety measures. And I was thinking if the IT department, the IT people in the Formula One will be will get inspired from the Formula One people, the car manufacturers, it turns out not really. They have also some of the issues that we all uh, developers and the IT people work in, and the, even their system are not designed in a safe and secure way. So fasten your seat, your seat bit. It's going to be a lot of information. I uh, probably need to go a little bit faster to cover the 10 safety measures that we do. And we're going to start with the five pre-crash measures, as I mentioned it. The five things we have and the Formula One people ensure before the driver race. 
And the first one is the, they have seat belts. It's normal, we have also seat belts in our car, but the Formula One seat belts are different. They have a six point harness, which can be released by the driver with a single hand movement. And this is what it looks like. It's impossible for the driver while entering the car to uh, fasten the seat belt by himself. The, he, like he needs definitely help because it's a lot of, uh, it's a six harness point. But if they make sure that it can be released super fast by a click of a button. And if you think about it from a software engineering point of view, this is actually the equivalent of push to deploy, right? There are a lot of things, a lot of steps that we need to follow in order to get there. But once we get there, you can release it as fast as possible. And it's equivalent for automation. Automation is really important in the way we release and ship our software uh, and our releases. It helps us avoid human errors because, yeah, we are humans, we don't excel at repetitive tasks, so the more automation you have, you basically remove the human factor and the human risk. And it also enables you to enable your team to focus on innovation, to focus on doing things right, to release the software faster. The second thing they have is a stringent dynamic static and load test to ensure the safety of the drivers. And that means they are testing the car in all the conditions, in all the environments that it's gonna probably experience during the race day. They test the car in a cool day, in a very hot day, in a warm day, in a windy day, in a rainy day, to collect data and see how the car reacts and ensure that they have they covered whatever uh, issue they may encounter during a race day. And this is the equivalent of having a trusted, repeatable, and adversarial CI-CD pipeline. And adver adver adversarial is really important here because we ensure that everyone has a seat into the table. Everyone's voice is heard while we are building this stringent dynamic process that makes sure that any change in the code are tested in the same condition that it's gonna encounter in production not only at one point in time, but at any moment in time. Another thing that helps us to test our application when it's go to production is Canary deployment. Canary deployment is uh, a software engineering pattern that enable you to ship the new code path, the new code changes, and release them to a subset of the users in production. And you can go further and you have it automated, the checks, and you have checks in place that validate if there are increased errors, increased latencies, increased uh, security box and security our failures. And you have metrics in place. So once you are confident, you run it for a couple of uh, minutes for whatever threshold that uh, good for you. And then once you have that, once you ensure that you have no obvious uh, issues, then you can release it to all our users. Otherwise, you can quickly roll back and uh, do whatever fixes you need to do to ensure that your code is actually not introducing new bugs and that helps you to gain confidence over the reliability of your uh, new code changes. Moving on, the cockpit, they make sure that, or they build the cockpit uh, that is a deformable crash protection structures. They built, this is the cockpit, and this is actually designed for the worst case. They built this structure with the whole purpose of saving the driver's life, of keeping the driver safe. And in software engineering, we need to design for failure. We as developers, no longer need to focus on feature only. We need to design those features to be more resilient, to be more tolerant. We need to design those features to be resilient against network outages, database outages, patches failures, whatever. Another thing that can enable us to secure uh, our deployment at our cluster is enable MTLS. So MTLS is very similar to TLS, and said it's a two-way encryption. 
And it's really needed in a distributed uh, application since you have both your services are both client and uh, servers. So instead of TLS is basically uh, the, the, the clients go to the server and uh, they basically ask for a certificate. So whenever they want to call the server, they need to provide a certificate in order to get the data. This is the same pattern, the same logic. However, we're having, we having it in both ways, both the client and the server, and all your services are authenticated. And that will help you, even if an attacker manages to get inside your cluster, he will see very limited on understanding what's going on and the data that is uh, propagating inside your cluster. And things like Envoy, implementing the sidecar patterns can help you implement such things really easy. Another thing we can do is designing our architecture in a micro-segmented way. That means we are, that we are keeping the sensitive systems out from the internet and as far away from the internet as possible. So even if an attacker manages to sneak in and get access, he will only get access to the internet-facing systems. And our system will deform itself in order to protect what uh, the various information we have, which is the user's data, in the same manner as uh, the cockpit saves the driver's lives and deform to protect the driver's life. The fourth thing they have is before they race, driver must demonstrate they can get out of the car within five seconds. This is basically the FIA, the FIA telling the drivers, if the crash happened, you need to get out of the car quickly. If you, can get, if you can't get out of the car under, sorry, under five seconds, goodbye. You, can you cannot race for the day. And this is not only designed for the worst case, this is actually testing for the worst case, right? And the equivalent for us developers in the software engineering is actually chaos engineering. In our systems, we all have things that we know our applications. And we know that we don't know uh, how our system will react in some conditions. And we hope for the best. But what scares me the most is the things that we don't know, we don't know about our system. So adopting Things like chaos engineering will help us reduce the unknown unknowns and uh, discover new things, learn from the system failure by actually trying to break our system ourselves. And it, the good thing with chaos engineering, it is basically works as a training model for your SRE, whatever, engineer, whatever team is controlling and uh, managing the servers and the services. So when an incident, an actual incident happened, they already went through the process and their mind is already fresh in order to respond to incidents. And when we heard chaos engineering, we can start small. It doesn't need to kill the whole cluster. You can start by introducing some delays to your system and see how your system reacts. Learn from it. Do whatever you are gonna do in order to fix whatever uh, issues and errors you had. And then repeat the process and grow gradually. Then you can start to show in errors, 400s, 500s. And then you can go wild, kill a database, kill a whole cluster, sky is the limit. And the last measure in the pre-crash is a constant monitoring and replacement of tires. Now, check out this video from the readable team. This is actually the world record in changing the tires. One second, 82 milliseconds. And check how proud they are of changing the tires, not replacing them, changing the tires in under two seconds. Now, if you compare this to the way we manage our service, at least traditionally, why the hell we in software engineers and uh, especially ops people are proud of keeping our VMs, our servers up for months, weeks, or even days. What would happen if we treat our system the same way as the pit crew is doing? Now, we all know the pits versus cattle, zoomorph zoomorphic uh, metaphor. And it's basically saying that with the rise of uh, the cloud, we no longer should treat our servers as uh, our friends, as a member of the, of the family. We should treat, treat them as cattle. 
mean that we should store them as well, remove them as well, because yeah, infrastructure is cheap. But what happens if we push that concept and this metaphor one step further and go to chickens? Remember that the uh, average lifetime or average uh, time to for the cattle to reach adult, adulthood is months compared to chicken, which is weeks. And the amount of resources you need to invest in the chicken to reach adulthood is actually way more less than the cattle. And for our infrastructures, that means we need new systems, new metrics to, sorry, not systems, metrics to monitor our infrastructure. And a good blog from Diego Monica, who mentioned two things, the reverse uptime. And in order to understand it, it's actually Take an example. Imagine that an attacker managed to get inside your node. And that's by itself is bad. However, he managed to cover himself and use your this node as a base to attack other nodes. Or yeah, you can do some some mining there. But what happened if your system is continuously revision old nodes? Let's say after a one day the node is completely removed and replaced. So the attacker would basically need to do the same thing, redo the same work. So at least you solve it the problem temporarily, right? From a security point of view, it is impossible to backdoor a system that is constantly revaged. If you have a reverse uptime of one day, you are sure that an attacker cannot stay in one node more than one day. Combine this with the base image freshness, the base image that you use to deploy across the whole fleet, across uh, and is shared between all your services. If you combine it from, if you combine it with the reverse uptime, if you have even a, a, a critical security vulnerability, let's say a zero-day vulnerability, you know that once you fix the base image freshness and you fix that Linux day zero vulnerability the maximum amount of time that it is needed in order to fix all your cluster is actually the reverse uptime. So the smaller the reverse uptime team is, the more you gain from a security point of view. How are we doing? A lot of information, keeping up? Cool. Now we're going to the post-crash measures. Once the car hit something, there is an accident. What we can learn so once there's a crash, they designed the car in a way, in a modular way, that driver can be extricated from the car by lifting out the entire seat. Now compare this to a normal car. If there's an accident, we need to open the door, and if the door is locked, we need to break it, whatever, and we need to remove the seat belt in order to get the driver out, and we lose some precious moment to save the driver's life. However, if the driver passes away, and the safety team is there, if they cannot get it out of the car, they basically remove the whole seat with the driver and provide him with any necessary uh, help. And it's kind of the design of the car, I, I mentioned this before, designed the car in a modular way. And this is the equivalent of having a loosely coupled components in your architecture, right? Uh, think how fast you can react in order in a bad day, how fast you can invalidate a certificate that, it, that was exposed to the internet, how can you fast you can pull out and invalidate an SSH key that you wrongly pushed it to the internet, how fast you can remove a secret from your Kubernetes containers, whatever, how fast you can regenerate new password for all your users if your password is shared on the dark web. The more loosely coupled your system is, the more faster you can react in order uh, if, if something happened. Cool. The other thing they have is uh, hands, and hands stand for hand and neck system that absorbs and redistributes forces that would otherwise hit the driver's skull and neck muscles. And this is what a hands look like. It's basically before, because, yeah, you know, the Formula One did drive super fast. It's a crazy motorsport. But then if a crash happened, the forces generated by the crash are, yeah, crazy. Then 
what the hand system does is basically they take the forces redistributed through the body that would otherwise hit the driver's skull and neck muscles. And from a software engineering point of view, this is the equivalent of having an elastic architecture. If you are having a good day, a lot of, you get a lot of traffic. Probably uh, your latest post in Hacker News really work, and you are getting a lot of traction and attention from the internet. You need to have load balancer in place that would distribute the traffic across the whole node, making sure that your system keep up and running. If even with that, your system can't keep up, you should have some autos auto scaling in place that would trigger new nodes and trigger new services to handle the load. And be uh, aware here that you need to define some metrics because if you are having a DDoS attacks and you can't uh, get it out, your, your cluster will be uh, auto scaling and definitely. So you need to have some metrics in order to not scale a lot of services and uh, your boss will not be happy with your cloud provider bill in the end of the month. Um, if one of the services is started to act really slow and the response time is taking uh, really longer to uh, proceed. So we should ha you should have, or we should have, a request time threshold that basically cut the connection and freeze, uh, free up some resource processes and threshold in order to process other requests. In a lot of scenarios, in a lot of uh, depending on uh, your business need, having a degrading performance is a lot more better than having uh, errors or your website is not responding at all. So in, in a lot of scenarios, it's a, a better alternative than having uh, an outage or not responding at all. And finally, having anti-overload patterns in place, such as circuit breaking and exponential backoff can help if your system started to react uh, a little bit weird. Moving on, drivers wears suit fire resistant. And remember this picture? Or uh, yeah, from our friends Roma. So Roma managed to stay in the heat for a couple of minutes because of his uh, fire resistant suit. And it is really special since the fire resistant suit can or its job is basically keep the driver's body under 41 degrees Celsius for a period of time. So even if you are surrounded by extreme heat, a fire or you are inside the fireball, as we saw earlier, you can still your this diff or the what is called the suit will keep you a little bit cool. 41 is a lot, but yeah, better than being burning inside the car. And this is the equivalent of keeping the attacker in. We're trying to minimize the damage that even if an attacker manages to get inside, minimize the damage that he can do or perform to uh, your system. And we can do that by following a couple of patterns and principles. Things like the least privileged principle. Making sure that your services, your processes, are running with the minimum set of access rights and resources that enable them to, to perform its function. Building your system in a defense in depth way, and that means having layers, multiple layers of defense that when an attacker manager to uh, pass one of them, you, like they will be need to do additional works in order to get inside the uh, important services and critical services. And having uh, implementing a zero trust policy actually in the, in the infrastructure the more suspicious you are, the better in the way you design the com your communication policies. Trust no one, trust no node, no user, no cluster, no services. Each user, service, node should be authenticated in order to get a response. And uh, another thing that help us keep the driver air in is basically hardware security modules. And to understand what hardware, so hardware security models, there are uh, some companies, private companies that have them, and they are also available in your, uh, in many of the cloud providers. And to understand what hardware security modules are, let's actually take an example. So let's imagine that you have 
a mission critical application that save the users. And then you have users passwords in some database and you are using a function to hash the password, right? And you save that in the database. And imagine an attacker manages to get in your, into your cluster, get all the data out from your cluster. Then he will have all the time he needs in order to break and uh, hack the passwords, right? He can do some brute force attacks to uh, reverse engineer how you use it for the password. And you won't know until you find it in the dark web and you will find yourself in the news the next day. With the hardware security modules, we do the same thing. However, we, each time we need to hash a password, we get a key from the hardware security module, right? So even if an attacker now manages to get inside our system, the data he will get out is basically useless since each and every time he will need to get the key from the hardware security module in order to try to hack the password. So we are keeping the attacker in place and luckily, uh, or hopefully you can, uh, can be aware of his existence and uh, kick him out, out of your cluster. The, the fourth thing they have in the post-crash measures is a fire suppression system that can be activate activated by the driver, externally by the team or the, by uh, the safety team or fire, fire team and by the race marshal. And this is what a fire resistance system looks like. But think how, did, how well the distributed access depending on the need and the use case. If the driver crashed and he's awake, like he's awake, he can turn it off or turn it on by himself. If the driver passed away and there is the safety team arrived earlier, then they can trigger it. There is a button outside of the car. If the driver passed away and the safety team cannot get into the car because for whatever reason, then the race, race marshal can trigger it into, like externally and remotely. And we need to distribute access depending on the need for our application as well. Having well-defined access policies uh, for both our users and our applications help our teams, especially security teams, to, to define what we call micro parameters that they can use to give access to uh, the users and define communication policies where each service user node is authenticated in order to be served and get a response. And finally, they have data records that keep speed and deceleration forces so doctors know the severity of an impact. And they are really crazy about that. Like if you check the data that the Formula One people collect and the driver or uh, the teams collect during the race, it's really crazy. They collect information about everything. And from a safety point of view, it helps the doctors to know the severity of the impact once it happened. So they know already how bad the impact was and what necessary measures they need to provide uh, to the driver if there is a bad uh, accident. And needless to mention how important having monitoring tools in our system. No system should go to production without monitoring tools in place. And also having alerting uh, system that triggers or detect unusual behavior at trigger alerts. And hopefully you can react to that and uh, kick out the attackers. And it's all about trade-off. This is how the drivers, the drivers in the Formula One drive the car. It's not the best way you can imagine a car. It's really uncomfortable, I would say. However, it's a trade-off between security and safety and speed. And the same thing needs to apply when we are designing our architecture. It's a trade-off between velocity, the increase of the velocity, how faster you can ship your uh, releases, and also from a security point of view, how you can ship those soft releases faster in a secure manner. And I want to end this presentation with this scary number from IBM Security Folks. They publish each year uh, a cost of a data breach report, a lot of insights in there. And in 2021, they found that 
The average business cost for a cyber attack is actually more than four million. And this is a scary, scary number for me. It takes over 287 days to detect the breach. So most likely, in one of our nodes and servers and cluster, there's already an attacker there using our node as a base to do some mining or attack other services. So I hope that throughout this presentation, we had some, uh, we discovered some patterns, some frameworks that we can adopt in our architecture to enable us to increase velocity while keeping the security of the data, the security of our users uh, in the back of our mind. Thank you. That's good. Any questions? There are, those are some resources if you need them. Questions? Thanks. Any questions? Go in once. Go in twice. Thank you. Uh, I'll be there in the, the rest of the conference here today. And if you need, however, to reach me for whatever question, please do. Thank you. Thank you.